We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Global Roads to Digital Sovereignty. My name is Michał Rekowski and I'm a program director of the Institute, a non-partisan Polish think tank specializing in cybersecurity and digital technologies. The Kościuszko Institute is also the organizer of the CyberSec, European Cybersecurity Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, last decade saw an emergence of a concept that is playing an increasingly important role in global politics and global technology governance. Digital sovereignty is on the rise everywhere, from South America to Asia and from Europe to Africa. Today, we hope to share with you various perspectives on the matter. I will have a great pleasure to moderate today's panel discussion, and please let me welcome our distinguished guests. Joining us tonight are Captain Romeric Algabla, Chief Technology Officer of the Togo Digital Agency. Welcome, sir. Ms. Natalia Lobo, Director of Sector Policy of the Secretariat of Telecommunications of Brazil. Welcome, madam. Professor Ang Penghua of the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Welcome, Professor. And Professor Paul Timmers, Research Associate at the University of Oxford and Professor of the European University Cyprus. As you can see, we have a panel of tremendous speakers. For years now, there have been a growing feeling that the expansion of the global internet and the advancements in digital technologies present a challenge to states and societies capacity to master their own fate. In the most common understanding, digital sovereignty denotes states or societies' efforts to reestablish their authority over the internet and ensure that their interests are protected in the accelerating digital revolution. Mm -hmm. The first two decades of the global growth of the internet were accompanied by the underlying belief that the decentralized and open character of digital networks would eventually empower the citizens and bring about democratization to all corners of the world. We could observe tangible examples of how the internet actually challenges sovereign authority in popular uprisings in different parts of the globe. But that feeling seems to fade now as states reestablish themselves. On the other hand, the largest technology companies from both America and Asia have become global actors, shaping daily functioning of individuals and societies with interest in every corner of the world. These corporate actors wield immense power over various strands of social lives, often outpacing states in their influence on cru crucial issues of national importance, such as the direction of economic development or dynamics of social order. But they also may challenge the principles of democratic self-determination, limiting individuals' autonomy and transforming the sphere of individual privacy. As data becomes increasingly economically important and the commodification of data dominates the direction of economic growth, states start to perceive data loss resulting from transnational data flows as loss of control of sovereign assets. Hence, we can witness the discussions on storing data within national borders. We should not also overlook the deepening, deepening digital divide between digitally developed and least developed countries that creates the risk of embedding the latter in a structurally disadvantaged position. Then in the last few years, internet and digital technologies, in particular digital infrastructure, have been increasingly seen by policymakers as a geopolitical asset, one that can and should be used in the pursuit of nation's prominence. As a consequence, digital sovereignty is on the lips of decision makers and civil society leaders all around the world. But roads that lead to digital sovereignty may differ or lead through differing territories. There is no consensus on how they should be followed. 
So let's listen to the perspectives of our distinguished speakers. Captain Agbagla, I would like you to ask you to take the floor and present your perspective on digital sovereignty, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you well. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, to thank you for this uh, great opportunity to share experience and knowledge on digital sovereignty. To go deeper in the subject, uh, for us, digital sovereignty is the ability to have control over your own digital destiny. Uh, both talking about data, software, and hardware. Um, to explain uh, my talk, I will first draw the fact in Africa, because I'm looking from the African perspective. Uh, first of all, most of our data is hosted overseas. All of the data we are producing is either in the cloud overseas or uh, not used in the country itself. Uh, we have also this fact, no major African companies in top 20 of global tech brands. And then uh, we are experiencing a phenomenon of vendor locking and lack of knowledge transfer in all of digital projects uh, we are conducting in, here in the African continent. Uh, what is that stake? Um, this is digital economy because this is a growing part of our economy. This is an opportunity to create job and to have sustainable development. This is a way to control our own destiny, uh, not imposed or influenced by a third party. Uh, in the fact also, I forgot to mention that the digital, what I call the digital manipulation through social network. If you don't have a control on those technology, your population is open to any kind of manipulation coming from those mass media. What are our perspective uh, on our own data on this matter? Uh, Togo just built a tier three data center in order to host their own data they are producing and also find a way to exploit it and uh, uh, generate wealth from it. Uh, secondly, we want to increase presence um, in digital open source projects. Our future digital law will uh, require every major project to use open source technology as feasible as possible. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but we need to customize and integrate. So um, going, going from open source, we should have our custom systems. Uh, we want to promote our own technological initiative uh, for example, uh, Togo is the first sub-Saharan country joining the EU Digital COVID Certificate Network. So uh, we set up um, we set up internally a platform to generate um, COVID-19 pass, and we just integrate uh, this platform with the European Union. COVID certificate platform. Uh, we are also building what we call public service platform, one shop for the citizen for D2, D2C and C2D. Uh, we want also to, to think regionally, not individually. Uh, Togo is part of the West African unique identification for regional integration and inclusion program 
led by the World Bank. This is about biometric ID. And we also want to secure our internet connection. So we are working on that, uh, on uh, two aspects. First aspect is to have our, to promote our own exchange point, our local exchange point, and uh, to um, diversify uh, the source of internet. So we are working toward to have a second undersea cable for uh, internet services. Uh, this is all I have to say about uh, digital sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Professor Ang, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So I uh, thank you for the honor of uh, being the first to ask the question. Uh, and I'm asking Paul uh, from Oxford. Uh, I just came from, from a session at Giganet, uh, the academic uh, guys, um, and I uh, heard your colleague talking about digital sovereignty in Europe, your colleague, uh, Dr. Giovanni Di Gregorio. So this is a surprising turn of events for me because it was not so long ago that the people, only people talking about uh, digital sovereignty were superpowers. And they basically wanted to flex their, their offline muscles into the online space. So for Europe, is there a shared framework or set of principles um, that the European Union looks at for digital sovereignty? Or do members have different notions of digital sovereignty? And do member states need to come together to have a collective approach to digital sovereignty? And if so, if there's such a collective approach, how successful can they be if they're not collective? Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Ang, uh, for uh, for the question. Uh, and let me let me take it right away. If Michal uh, uh, agrees, uh, let me do that. Uh, and also, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, event, to the IGF, which has a very special place, at least for me, in my thinking about the digital world. Well, one thing uh, that is perhaps good to stress is, you know, a little bit close to what uh, Captain Agbagla just said. Uh, digital sovereignty is actually more the means in the digital world to safeguard your sovereignty. Uh, so it's about your knowledge, your your capabilities. Uh, it's about how much you can do, your capacity, and uh, how much control that you have to safeguard your sovereignty. And sovereignty, so digital sovereignty is perhaps a new term. Sovereignty is actually not so much a new term for uh, the European countries because they have always been working together to share sovereignty under the European treaties. Even, uh, you might say, um, that has increased over the years to share and to pool sovereignty at European level. So perhaps not so strange that digital sovereignty in the sense of let's also safeguard our sovereignty collectively in the digital world in that sense has come up uh, quite strongly. Your question is that then a common approach to that depends, I think, very much on uh, how people uh, from the various countries are stepping into this domain of digital sovereignty. If they have very strong national security hat on, then it's quite difficult to get to common ground. If they actually see that uh, national security can be best safeguarded in many cases by working together, uh, things really change. Then uh, something of a common perspective emerges, and I would call that a triple win perspective, a win-win-win perspective. Let me illustrate that very briefly. Um, if, for example, uh, you want to protect your networks against uh, cyber incidents, uh, cyber threats, uh, cyber attacks, then each of the countries in Europe are actually too small, even the largest ones, are too small to do that completely on their own. Uh, the networks are very much interconnected, the market is interconnected, disturbance in one country will spill over into trade in other countries. So there's a, an a interest to protect your national se economic security by working together. So actually your national, your national sovereignty will uh, be better protected by working together. Secondly, if you work, that's one win. Secondly, if you work together, then you're also building up new digital assets to collectively. And a good example is actually .eu. That's a joint asset. It's owned by everybody. And actually, uh, it's something that, uh, as an asset, is something that belongs to all Europeans. So it's a sovereign asset, too. And so you're building up uh, critical infrastructures that span the continent. You're building up new facilities like data spaces or .eu that are shared facilities. The second win. The third win, if you build up uh, stronger collectively, jointly, stronger uh, digital assets and a stronger position in cybersecurity, 
you also have more of a voice in the world, exactly as you mentioned, you know, uh, in between the superpowers, Europe uh, feels that it has to have a place in the world, that it have to, has to have a voice in the world. And you can only do that credibly if you've got also something to fall back upon, if you have your, your national or your collective uh, sovereign assets. So it also strengthens the, the external dimension of sovereignty. So I think you can also talk about it like a triple win. Thank you, Professor Timmers. Now I would like to ask Director Lobo to give your perspective on digital sovereignty. Please, the floor is yours. Director Lobo, I think you're muted. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry here. Um, First, I would like to, to, to compliment everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, calling me for this panel. It is a pleasure to join you all here today, uh, maybe this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. So before touching the specific concept of digital sovereignty, I would like to provide some basic information on how Brazil approaches the issue of governance in the digital environment. Back in 95, Brazil established a national internet steering committee that from the outset was modeled, modeled as a multi-sector uh, stakeholder governance mechanism, bringing together government, private sector, academia, and civil society. In 2014, new and specific internet legislation was approved, known as the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights, the Max Civil of Internet. Brazil is as well as an active participant in international internet governance mechanisms. Indeed, Brazil hosted the 2015 edition of this internet and governance forum in the city of João Pessoa. Over the years, the internet grew tremendously in Brazil. Nowadays, we have over 4.8 million domains registered in Brazil and the Sao Paulo internet exchange is one of the largest in the world. Brazil has a very vast population, around two, over 2,210 million people, and has a, is the fifth greatest territory in, in the planet, um, summing up 8.5 million square kilometers. So despite these challenges, we are making much significant progress in expanding network infrastructure and providing connectivity all over the country. The most recent numbers show that over 81% of households in Brazil have either fixed or mobile broadband service subscriptions. Internet use in homes is also noticeably gender balanced in Brazil, with 79% of women and girls and 75% of men and boys using internet. So um, in 2017, with the increasing role of the digital technologies in the economy and in the services provided by government, along with the impact of digital technology on the daily lives of citizens, Brazil developed a national digital transformation strategy. This strategy is based on a whole of government approach to digital issues with broad engagement of the private sector and of society at large. This strategy, published in early 2018, is built along nine pillars and covers both enablers of digital transformation, including network infrastructure, R&D, trust, capacity building, and international cooperation, and pillars of the digital transformation per se, digital transformation of the economy and of government. The strategy is modeled on a four year sliding window period to take account of technological development and institutional developments. In, 20, in 2020, this strategy was peer reviewed by the OC, OECD Committee of Digital Economy Policy as, go, as part of the Going Digital Initiative. Based on the strategic action set forth in the National Digital Transformation Strategy over the last four years, several normative instruments and policy initiatives have, have matured, including a national digital government strategy, a national cybersecurity strategy, now Brazil ranks 18th um, globally in the International Telecommunications Union, Union's Global Cybersecurity Index, uh, a national artificial intelligence strategy, 
uh, with reference to the OECD AI Policy Observatory, and a functional, functioning National Data Protection, Protection Authority, along with specific legislation on personal data protection, which shares many concepts of the European framework and GDPR. So in short, I would say that our view of digital sovereignty is based on combining on the one hand openness and innovation, and on the other hand, regulation where deemed necessary, always through a national consensus driven process. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And now I would like to give the floor to Professor Timmers to ask the question. And also, I would like to ask all of you to stress your responses to two minutes. So two minutes as we are running out of time. Professor Timmers, the floor is yours. Uh, so uh, a question for Captain Agbaila. Thank you very much for your presentation. I found it also really interesting. Now, one of the things that uh, you might wonder about is if we talk about digital sovereignty, uh, in Europe, for example, you see a regional, you might say, collaboration between the 27 member states. Do you see something similar happening in Africa? And is it then the African Union that uh, kind of provides the common framework uh, for digital sovereignty in, uh, in uh, Africa? And would that work? Because, of course, there have been kind of precursors, like, for example, the collaboration on uh, the in the Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, which is there since 2014, but uh, of the 55 countries, it's only 14 that have signed. So how do you see that developing in Africa? Uh, thank you, Professor. And thank you also for your previous insights. Uh, obviously, we are on the same wavelength. If you want to go further, you need to go together. And for me, uh, there is no response. There is no individual response. So we need a regional um, answer. And uh, uh, we need to do that together. But there is a few key challenges. First of all, this is the leadership. Talking about the Convention of Malabo, um, the 2014, uh, the 2014 uh, uh, Cybersecurity Convention and uh, uh, GDPR. Uh, there, is, there are only a few countries who sign it because uh, the lack of leadership. Uh, people don't understand what is really at stake. So. We need the leadership, but we need also the education uh, for them. Uh, that is why the intended um, cybersecurity summit Togo want to organize, but postpone uh, for the next year. It's about to uh, share uh, knowledge and increase literacy on this matter. And, and so we, we, we really, really need to increase uh, the leadership and education on this matter and also promote digital literacy in the region so that people can better understand what is at stake. Uh, we don't have yet the same level of network and their connection like in Europe or in America, but certainly we are moving toward that. So uh, we should learn from those uh, uh, region for for the initiative in those region, and we should uh, incorporate at early stage all the necessary um, all the necessary amendments uh, in order to have um, a good regional uh, response. Uh, I Thank don't you. Know if... Thank you, Captain Akbagla, and I would also ask you to ask a question to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Lobo, in 2014, uh, Brazil has introduced the Brazil Internet Bill of Rights, called Marco Civil da Internet, sometimes also called the Internet Constitution. You just talk about it. What is the meaning of this document? And does it create a Brazilian way of regulating the digital revolution within the society? What are its core values and what does can learn from this example? What are lessons we can learn? Um, yeah, well, I agree with the assessment that it is the Brazilian way of regulating digital revolution, 
But it is important to note that this piece of legislation was developed in a very democratic process, including public hearings, discussion in committees before being voted and approved in Congress in 2014. Mm -hmm. This legislation includes provisions for rights and guarantees for internet users, responsibilities for personal data and private communications protection, keeping of records of connections and access to applications, and liabilities for any damages arising from content generated by third parties, specifically excluding intermediaries such as internet service providers. As well, this legislation includes definitions for net neutrality, including what is considered reasonable network management by network operators. Finally, it also defines the role of public authorities in ensuring the application of the law. So I believe this legislation was quite advanced for the time back in 2014, and it remains an important guidance for the regulation of internet in the country. Thank you, Director, and it's also your turn to ask the question. Okay, then. Um, Professor Ang, when faced with challenges to digital sovereignty states and societies react with different strategies, ranging from more open and democratic to more closed and autocratic, uh, what tendencies do you see in, the, in this context in Southeast and East Asia? It is known that China has a rather pronounced concept of its digital and, uh, or internet sovereignty. What about other countries in the region? How do you see it? Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, actually, uh, Professor Timmons has answered some of these, uh, given some broad, broad answers to this. Um, in my neck of the woods, um, actually, we don't talk that much about um, uh, digital sovereignty. Uh, and, and let me give an analogy. I, I asked uh, people, you know, the diplomats of every country, we had a meeting once, um, ASEAN meeting, and asked everybody, like, you know, you guys know that USA controls the internet? And, and privately, publicly, were well, like protests, like, you know, we want to be sovereign and all that, but privately they said, we don't mind, you know, they are holding the ball, they have the rules that are fair, they let us play, we will play football with them. But you can let us have the ball and have the fair rules, you know? So we don't, they don't, they don't uh, so much uh, worry much about, about uh, uh, sovereignty. But because of all this talk about data and so forth, there is a greater awareness now about data. And so there's some concerns now rising about, uh, about sovereignty. But you don't hear, you don't, you don't hear a lot of it. Um, I think part of the reason is that we are in the backyard of China. Uh, and then we are kind of in the, in the Pacific part of the USA. So we're trying to balance uh, both uh, interests, uh, you know, keeping this notion of being sovereign, but keeping both countries, both superpowers in mind. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. And it's now your turn to ask this second question. Okay. Um, hang on, let me ask the question. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was thinking that, uh, you know, people say data is a new oil. Uh, and we're seeing a scramble for data and uh, data protection. And I know that Brazil recently passed a uh, uh, the data protection law 2018 and created a data protection agency. Um, so what are the considerations that you uh, use to guide the development of these laws? Uh, what challenges lie ahead that you see? And I was thinking, should we remind people of the resource curse? You know? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I must, I must here uh, again say that the data protection law in Brazil is a piece of legislation developed in a very democratic process and came at a time of increased concern, concern over violation and of legitimate rights of users, of internet users. So it shares many common elements with the European uh, GDPR. And in this sense, it is indeed quite specific regulation placed in law. To ensure the application of the law and governance of the process, we created a National Data Protection Authority, ANPB. The authority has responsibilities to inspect the application of the law, develop additional norms and guidance for interpretation of the law, provide communication channels to inform the public, and to receive complaint, complaints from users about companies not respecting the law apply sanctions to those who violate the law and interact with other entities of the same nature in other countries. Of course, uh, given the global nature of internet, the challenge is to ensure that personal data protection is applied on the international, international scene. So this requires assessing the degree of equivalence of other data protection regimes 
so as to achieve interoperability. In fact, this is currently a central topic of discussions in multilateral and other international forums on digital economy. Thank you, Director. So now, oh, sorry. I would, is it my turn to ask? Yes, absolutely, it's your turn. Okay, so I'll be asking uh, Captain, uh, uh, Captain Akbagla, um, Togo is one of the course of implementation in the course of implementation of its digital strategy that sees some ambitions, ambitious targets like the provision of biometrics based on digital ID to its citizens or building a technology powered ecosystem that will enable economic innovation. Developing and implementing domestic innovations is important, but often it requires a reach out to foreign technology providers to obtain the base solutions, which may result in dependence on third parties, thus limiting sovereignty. What does Togo do to keep a balance between accelerating its digital development and strengthening its digital sovereignty? Captain Akbagla, you are on mute. Okay. Thank you, Director Lobo. Uh, I already touched on that on my perspective, but uh, our core principles are, first of all, promote our own innovation. Uh, we need to promote our own system, our own technology. We, we, we need to do it in our own way. That's the first core principle. Secondly, uh, we want to use open source software as feasible as possible. But even if in the ecosystem or in the world of open source software, we do have uh, well-supported open source or um, law-supported open source, but we want to go toward open source we can customize and uh, we can integrate uh, in our own systems. And thirdly, if we can't uh, go with open source software, we need to ensure that we have a knowledge transfer and um, uh, hosting our own data in the same way. Thank you, Captain. And it's your turn to ask the next speaker a question. Yes, uh, Professor Timmers, uh, in Europe, you can see both the EU and the national government to be increasingly active in different forms of building digital sovereignty. From joint cloud initiative to regulating data laws that aim to tackle numerous problems from overlines and external technology providers to commodification of users' data in global economy. As of the end of 2021, what do you consider to be the single biggest challenge to European digital sovereignty? What consequences can it have and what are European doings to address it? Yeah, thank you for uh, this question. So I think the, the word for the single biggest challenge is fragmentation. And that's fragmentation in terms of uh, political views, in terms of leadership, and I uh, uh, like that you also mentioned that, and also in terms of money, that the money is not being pulled sufficiently because this is a big world. And the consequence of that is that uh, this um, notion and the pursuit of digital sovereignty can be watered down. Um, well, you may like it or not, but uh, it can also lead to really uh, blatant weaknesses in the critical infrastructures if we don't collaborate because we are so fragmented. Now, what can you do about it? Well, uh, the whole digital sovereignty kind of notion and movement is uh, a response to external pressures, geopolitical tensions, the dominance of uh, digital platforms, that takes away sovereignty from governments uh, and uh, the risks of cyber incidents and the explosive rise of cyber attacks and cyber incidents. So actually external pressure works, you might say, and you see it also in Europe. Europe. The behavior of China threatening, the threat of political instability in the United States, conflict with Russia, pandemic, these are all external forces that help that fragmentation becomes less and that people start politically also to work together more. And you see it actually happening right now in Europe. Uh, there is much more a common approach emerging and also decision-making is actually speeding up. 
you must be helped by good leaders. You cannot, uh, well, okay, they say people uh, uh, elect the leaders that they deserve, but I am reasonably optimistic that there are a number of good leaders uh, at this moment in uh, Europe and also uh, new leaders coming. So I think actually there will be an acceleration of uh, the whole approach to digital sovereignty in Europe. I'm fairly optimistic about that. Now, there is an, one thing that I do want to mention there, and that also relates a little bit to one of the questions that was posed on the chat. I am not at all convinced that uh, digital sovereignty means that you do everything within your own continent and on and uh, uh, on your own. As a matter of fact, quite often actually you can protect your sovereignty best by working together globally. And uh, internet governance is actually a good example of that. Uh, everybody wins if we do that collectively uh, at global level. Thank you, Professor, and please ask the last question of this discussion. Yeah, so uh, to Professor Ang, I really would like to hear your opinion then about how uh, successful such collective approach uh, to technology governance and internet governance is, of course, what we have in mind, especially how uh, successful they can be. And how different is it if you work together at the global level from when you do this at the regional level? And what does that then actually mean if you work on technology governance at the global level for digital sovereignty, does it fit with that? And so there I it would also be interesting to hear for you, from you, especially for the global level, what are the most important lessons that we can learn when we look at regional efforts, uh, like an ASEAN or like at the European level? Okay, I will do, I'll answer in two minutes. Uh, I will say to look at uh, nuclear weapons as an example of how collective uh, attempts might be to do uh, you know, uh, technology governance. Uh, and my short answer is that I think that the collective attempts would only succeed when the countries involved, the states involved, the governments involved in uh, these attempts at collective governance see a benefit. In the case of nuclear weapons, you can see it was really stupid. Uh, you are building, uh, basically creating your nuclear waste and you are creating uh, dangers for yourself. I recently learned that actually a nuclear bomb uh, actually dropped in, um, in I think, in, in North Carolina. And a comedian joked that good thing there are two Carolinas, there's North and the South, right? Uh, so you can see the potential uh, dangers there. Um, so I think in this context that uh, this is context that I think that um, social media might be the next thing to regulate. I think we can see harm from that. And it's benefit from regulating this harm. It's not just hate speech, but also even for just the so-called normal use, we are, we are seeing psychological harm from excessive use of uh, social media. So I, I, I can expect some uh, collective attempts here. By collective, I don't mean that all working together. I mean, for example, sharing best practices, what works. So in the same way as what uh, Professor Timas talked about, how you don't have to necessarily uh, have it on your own land to, to regularly work with others. In the same way, a collective attempts will be with other people and not necessarily even like together, but learn from each other. I would say that in this context also that um, probably AI will not uh, have a co collective uh, governance here uh, because right now countries see benefit from uh, not regulating it. And I think the US just withdraw from some talks talking about regulating AI use in warfare. Uh, and, and the countries feel that, well, you know, if I, if I regulate, I'm controlling myself, I'm tying my hands. I shouldn't do it. Uh, so I, I, I would see the big picture here is the issue of, of uh, benefit. In ASEAN, uh, we are watching. Uh, there is no, I don't see any collective um, attempts. I had actually asked uh, some officials to consider a hotline for reporting uh, child pornography. I know there's one in Europe, in fact, more than one in Europe. There's none in Asia for child pornography. And you can see some of these places that have uh, child pornography. Uh, so I think in, in the ASEAN region, in Asia, uh, it, it will be much more challenging to have this kind of collective attempts. Yeah. We much learn from Europe here. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. So we are almost right on time. Uh, I think I did sense a, a bit of optimi optimism from what all of you have mentioned regarding the efforts to pursue digital sovereignty. Uh, I take uh, one thing that how it will develop globally will probably be shaped by the superpowers competition and the pressures that states states across the world uh, are exposed to. Nevertheless, uh, the, the, what is crucial, there are two elements from, from what I took from you. One is that it makes little sense to pursue digital sovereignty individually. 
the the scale effects uh, encourage states to to look for ways to work together and uh, second and what i believe would be the most visible um effort uh, uh, effect of of those pursuits is that they are done in a democratic way or for a democratic process that actually looks to various stakeholders to build the sense of what digital sovereignty should be and uh, also build the means to acquire it thank you all so much for sharing your opinions and thank you for joining this panel and with that i would conclude thank you thank you thank you yeah enjoy my, myself here right thank you very much thank you, thank you. bye thank you very much